Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shakespeare and Company. Faye is on a plane again. Having met her first in Outline, teaching a creative writing course in Athens, then in transit, constructing a new life for her family in London. In Kudos, she's on the move once more, travelling between a series of European cities from one author engagement to another. I say met, but as anyone who has read Rachel Cusk's trilogy will attest, one never really meets Faye, at least not in the way one has been conditioned to expect to meet characters in more conventional novels. Instead, we come to, what's the word, know, understand, apprehend Faye through a succession of conversations, almost monologues, during which she withholds and her interlocutor holds forth. These conversations are many and varied, and yet, as if subjected to an unconscious gravitational pull, Faye is repeatedly drawn into the orbit of certain themes. Womanhood, motherhood, marriage and divorce, the writer's life, her role, and the expectations placed upon her by readers, audiences, and journalists as well as the points where all these subjects intersect and overlap. Our grasp of Faye comes through what she chooses to tell us of what others choose to tell her, through how she chooses to tell it, and of course, through what we might speculate she has chosen to pass over in silence. While Rachel Cusk's work has always been too interesting to make her an establishment writer, the success, both critical and commercial, of her previous books means she could certainly be described as established. One of the many striking things, then, about reading Outline, Transit, and now Kudos is accompanying an established writer as she determinedly, meticulously, and courageously disestablishes herself, insisting upon writing from the margins, where the interesting, authentic, and important work gets done, at a significant professional, even personal risk. An exquisite melding of technical restraint, subject matter, and voice, books that contain multitudes, Outline, Transit, and Kudos resist interpretation, sometimes even description. In addition to Outline, Transit and Kudos, Rachel Cusk is the author of seven novels and three works of non-fiction. She's won and been shortlisted for numerous prizes, including the Folio Prize, the Goldsmiths Prize, the Baileys Prize, the Giller Prize, and the Canadian Government General's Award. Governor General's Award. In 2003, Rachel Cusk was nominated by Granta Magazine as one of 20 Best of Young British Novelists. In 2015, her version of Euripides' Medea was put on at the Almeida Theatre with Rupert Gould directing and was shortlisted for the Susan Smith Blackburn Prize. The Economist called Kudos the exhilarating finale of Rachel Cusk's magnificently unclassifiable trilogy of novels, describing it as a daring bonfire of hypocrisies and emotions, while Andrew Anthony, writing in The Observer, declared that these three books stand as a landmark in 21st century English literature, the culmination of an artist's unshakable efforts to forge her own path. Please join me in welcoming Rachel Cusk to Shakespeare and Company. <laughs> And since I said that the books defy description, I think it could be good to begin with a, a short reading to, to give people a taste of what um, to expect. I should say that all of those prizes, <clears throat> there was a lot of shortlisting, <laughs> not a lot of winning. So I had my bridesmaids outfit on for <laughs> a couple of years. Um, it's kind of hard to know. I'm, I'm assuming most people haven't read this book. Um, so it's always, I was thinking you should sort of begin at the beginning, but in fact, I'm, I'm going to read a different bit. Um, essentially, it's, uh, I mean, the form of these novels is um, sort of a novel turned inside out, like a, you could turn a jumper inside out. Um, uh, and the result is, is, essentially an impression of a lot of people talking. Um, so I'm going to read a little passage or a couple of pages from uh, a part of the book where we're in a European country, which for, if you're English, feels increasingly exciting. Um, <laughs> and um, it's a sort of writer's festival thing. And uh, there are writers of various nationalities who are all sitting down to lunch together. Louise sat down with an expression of undisguised irritation on his face and promptly joined the other men in discussing football, whereupon Sophia turned to me and meekly said into my ear that while she realised Louise could give the impression of being arrogant, in fact his success was painful for him and caused him to suffer from intense guilt as well as from feelings of overexposure. Unusually for a man of this nation, she said, and perhaps for any man, he has been honest about his own life. He has written about his family and his parents and his childhood home in a way that makes them completely recognisable. And because this is a small country, he worries he has used them or compromised them. Though, of course, for readers in other parts of the world, it is just the honesty itself that comes through. 
though of course if he were a woman, she said, leaning more confidentially towards my ear, he would be scorned for his honesty, or at the very least no one would care. She sat back so that the waiters could put the dishes on the table. They contained a brown, strong-smelling puree, and Sophia wrinkled her nose and said that this dish had a name that could more or less be translated as the parts no one would eat otherwise. She took a tiny spoonful and dabbed it on the edge of her plate. The Welsh novelist had by now appeared, his hair stiffened by the wind and his shirt unbuttoned to show his flushed neck. After some hesitation, he sat down in the only remaining seat beside Sophia, smiling warily to show his narrow yellow teeth. When he asked her what was in the dishes, she did not repeat her translation, but merely smiled graciously and said that it was a local delicacy made of ground meat. He reached forward and piled some onto his plate, as well as several pieces of bread. We would have to excuse him, he said. He was extremely hungry, having attempted to walk out along the coast and instead become increasingly entangled in a series of industrial complexes and housing developments and shopping precincts, all of which appeared to be in a state of semi-ruin and were more or less deserted, yet to which all roads unerr unerringly led, so that finally he was forced to clamber over walls and verges in the attempt to get to the water, finding himself at last in a cordoned-off concrete expanse, surrounded by barbed wire and what looked like numerous watchtowers, being held at gunpoint by three men in uniform. He had wandered, apparently, into a military zone, and it took all his scant linguistic resources to explain to these men that he was not a terrorist but a writer attending the literary conference, of which, perhaps surprisingly, they had heard. <coughs> They turned out to be quite genial and offered him coffee and tarts before sending him on his way, which he regretted not having accepted once he'd realised how far he was from the restaurant. He'd had to run most of the way back, he said, which in his walking boots was no easy feat. Luis's attention had been caught by this narrative and he launched into an account of the country's socio-economic decline which had been precipitated, he said, by the financial crisis nearly a decade earlier, whose reverberations in places like this one were still being felt. The Welsh novelist used this diversion as the opportunity to eat, nodding his head frequently while he dispatched his first course, and then, satisfied, sitting back in his chair. His own region of Wales, he said when Louise had finished speaking, was similarly on a more or less unrelievedly downward trajectory, though it had barely completed its evolution into the modern era in the first place. There were still families, he said, where only a generation earlier the elders had spoken no English, and in his conversations with local people he heard of a world in which humans had once lived deeply and richly in their own habitat, on familiar terms not just with one another, but also with animals, birds, mountains and trees, as well as with traditions of song and storytelling and worship, and of emotional histories too, of deep grudges and unbreachable rifts, of clans that married and intermarried, dwelling on the land in a reality all their own. Not forty years ago, he said, whole communities would climb the mountain together on Sundays, old ladies and babes in arms, strapping farmers and village girls and chattering gangs of children along with their dogs and ponies and baskets of food, of ham sandwiches and great thermoses of tea, and the men would sing as they climbed the hill. The novel he was currently writing was an attempt to revive that vanished world, and he had done considerable research into its manners and mores, as well as its agricultural practices, its culinary and domestic traditions, its patterns of church-going and socialising, its folklore, its vernacular poetry and song, he had interviewed countless people, most of them, for obvious reasons, elderly, and had built up a quite extraordinary picture in terms of his preparatory notes. Yet what was surprising was how often these people claimed to be relieved not to live in that way any longer, even as they expressed their nostalgia for it. Sometimes he almost thought he felt the loss of the old world more keenly than they did themselves, because he actually didn't see how they could bear the drabness of their old people's homes with their gutless conveniences of television and central heating, when what they remembered was so beautiful. Nothing remained, one old lady had said to him, of the world she knew. Not one blade of grass was the same. He had asked her to explain what she meant, because surely grass was at least still grass. But she had merely repeated that over the course of her lifetime, every single thing had changed and become unrecognisable to her. This lady had died peacefully not long after his conversation with her, and he felt lucky, he said, to have the chance to speak to her and record her memories, which otherwise would have died with her. 
Yet even as he re reconstructed those memories, so painstakingly that they shone like new in the pages of his novel, the meaning of her remarks about change continued to elude him. He could not, in the end, accept that the very essence of things had been lost, and at times he had almost become angry with her while writing, as though it was she herself who had stolen that essence and taken, away, taken it away with her for good. Luis had been listening with an impassive expression on his great moody face, his fingers occupied with tearing small sections from a piece of bread and dropping them into hard little balls, which he then rolling them into hard little balls, which he then dropped on the table around his plate. My mother once told me, he said, that at harvest time when she was a child, the village held a day of festival and the farmers would always leave one last field to mow on that day. Everyone would stand to watch the men mowing with their scythes because this was a tradition. And it was also a tradition that they left a circular patch in the middle of the field unmown, working in from the edges of the field rather than up and down in straight lines as they usually did. All of the frightened wildlife that normally had the opportunity to run away was therefore trapped in this circle, he said, which got smaller and smaller as the men mowed around it, so, to, so that in the end there were a great number of creatures cowering there. The village children had already been armed with shovels and picks and even knives from the kitchen, and at a certain moment they were permitted to come forward and descend on the unmown circle in a cheering mob to kill the animals, which they did with great pleasure and gusto spattering themselves and each other with blood. My mother cannot think about these episodes, he said, without becoming upset, even though at the time she participated in them quite happily. And indeed many of our relations now deny that such barbaric, barbaric practices ever occurred. But my mother says that they did, and she continues to suffer on account of them, because unlike the others, she has remained honest, and she refuses to remember the past without also remembering its cruelty. I sometimes wonder, he said, whether she believes she sealed her own fate with that unthinking conduct, because life has treated her cruelly in return. <coughs> Yet it is only her sensitivity that creates that impression, and her relatives, as I have said, don't see things that way at all. When I started to write, he said, it was because I felt the pressure of her sensitivity, as though it was an affliction or unfinished task I had to take from her, or something she had bequeathed to me that I had to fulfil. Yet in my own life, I've been as doomed to repetition as anyone else, even when I didn't know what it was I was repeating. Thank you so much. <laughs> of course, we are here to talk about, uh, specifically about kudos, but it's difficult to talk about kudos without, of course, talking about outline and transit, because the three books make, um, make a unit. Um, and I'd like to begin... Uh, by coming back to that, what you said um, earlier about the, it's like a jumper turned inside out, um, because it's, I think it's, it's very rare to come across uh, ev even one book that is able to sustain uh, a harmony of form, of tone, of content um, over, yeah, over the space of one book, and you've managed to do it over three. And I'm intrigued by the f genesis of the approach. Like, was it a sort of a sense of you had a subject, you had something you wanted to write about, and the the form and the tone developed from from the subject, or did the the formal restraints, the technical restraints, come first, and 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 then you found um, what to fill it afterwards? It would have been nice if <laughs> <laughs> it had just developed in that lovely way that you've described. Uh, no, it was breaking rocks by the side mm -hmm. of the road. I mean, it was very, very, very hard to work it out, um, and it came out of a feeling that. Uh, the forms in which I had written, which were sort of binary, I guess, you know, I'd written novels and then there were things that for some reason that I didn't, well, I probably did analyse it to death, but, but it didn't stop me d doing it. I, I, I couldn't put some mm -hmm. material in, you know, the novel wasn't the right form and so I wrote in the memoir form because that seemed to me the you know, the best available form mm. and, uh, f for what I wanted to say. Um, so, I, you know, I did that for a long time and it it became completely obvious to me that, that particularly the memoir form malfunctioned mm -hmm. and uh, that, that offering oneself as an um, example, which mm -hmm. is how I used it, um, 
and that was really to talk about aspects of life that that where there had to be an example mm -hmm. where where expecting somebody to to make the transition of of belief disbelief mm -hmm. whatever you know into an, into sort of fictional representation wasn't right it seemed motherhood was you know a very mm -hmm. good example of that and so you had to say i and, so, and i didn't care i mean I, mm -hmm. you know i was just offering the i as but but I suppose what I the malfunction I would say mm. was was it created the opportunity for people to to say to seize the eye and say mm. oh you're that woman who uh -huh. <laughs> who's got these problems with being a mother or or so so it it, it didn't work and mm. it ended up being um uh very I was violently criticized mm. um in those for those books uh so that gave me a yeah pause for thought mm -hmm. and i thought okay how how can you um speak without uh presenting yourself as a target mm -hmm. and i think that that is specifically to do with being female mm -hmm. um i think that you know a now scarred does the same thing but sure. because he's male white you know mm -hmm. scandinavian i don't know uh -huh. I, his, it, the target is of no particular interest mm -hmm. no no one needs to defend themselves against that honesty mm -hmm. um because people have talked about um the the sort of the form you you landed on for these novels as kind of a reinvention of a, the novel a new form of the novel and so it's it seems from what you're saying that uh this new form didn't come out necessarily of a desire to to, oh, okay, I'm going to do something new, but almost of a of a need, in a sense. Yeah, um, I, I mean, as anyone in in, in um, a, a crisis of of living, mm -hmm. of identity, which I was, you know, um, ha has to consider whether they're, you know, they're going to doggedly uh -huh. <laughs> carry on, or the, whether they're going to change, and and uh, change is is frightening. Mm -hmm. um, but it's uh, it's essential. Um, mm -hmm. I suppose I didn't realise how much what I saw as change was also a, a, a change of, of the form itself, mm -hmm. and and um, that, that possibly it was a a sort of opportunity to break some new ground. Mm -hmm. I guess. And once you once you had landed on the 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 form the the, the means of of, ex of expressing what you wanted to express um and, and achieving it with outline was there then a sort of a post factum sort of establishing of rules yeah for for the next book <laughs> okay i can well do no, this. Uh, establishing rules right from the start okay. which was um i mean i think the 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 issue of self-control mm -hmm. is is a really interesting one when you're um trying to say things that that are that still have some radicalness if mm -hmm. that's a word um about them and for me f femininity and female experience which you know i've kept very much within um pretty universal female mm -hmm. experiences that's what i've been interested in in talking about mm -hmm. um you know that that it, it remains radical to to talk about those things and so i think when you're documenting new bits of life mm. the the issue of self control and discipline um seems slightly remote and that uh. seems like something that belongs rather to to sort of scholarship or yeah. or i don't know an academic mm. view of life that mm. that um i'd rather neglected possibly mm. uh or at least I went out to seek those things to to educate myself to know but but I don't think I asked great self control of myself mm -hmm. in the way that that um I asked I asked precision and lots of other things but mm -hmm. but not that and so this really required um me to to not <laughs> mm -hmm. go into a particular space and uh -huh. and writing it was from the first sentence of outline to the last sentence of kudos it was the same feeling of of i would go down a sent start to drive down a sentence and uh -huh. have to reverse out of it because it was going mm. it was a sentence 
that was like the sentence equivalent of Fifth Avenue. You uh-huh. know, it was a sentence that that everyone went down and that that where all the bad things could happen. So I had to, you know, not do that. Um, was was there not then a current a sort of concurrent sense of of liberation within the constraints, like the schools, like the Ulupo talk about, like in yeah. adding mathematical restraints, they get a they absolutely. get a sense of freedom no, in their absolutely. writing. Absolutely, and and well, poetry. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, that's what's of course. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. It's hard to it is hard to write a sonnet. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I guess, but it's easier to write a sonnet because it has rules than to um, to write mm-hmm. free verse. Um, so yeah, there, there was, I mean, and once I understood it, and really it was te- completely mm-hmm. technical. What I had understood was totally technical mm-hmm. um, about what had what was going wrong in in sort of all these forms, and not just in my own work, in other uh-huh. people's work too. Um, it seemed to me, mm-hmm. and and that wasn't a criticism. It was it was a sort of dawning <laughs> realization that that I happened to have. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I. It, you know the sort of unfortunate result is it's made it really hard for me to read mm-hmm. so <laughs> um. i'd like to return to this idea about uh, the fact and it, it was a sensation i had well when reading the books that this book could these books could not have been written by a man um it's not even sort of ne- not necessarily would not have been written but like this sort of you know setting aside the fact of sort of you know no book by any author could have been written by anybody else in fact this it's so deeply personal to the author but there was something so deeply connected to uh, the fact that the protagonist was a woman, the fact that that you're a woman, like there was, um, yeah, something sort of that would have sort of prohibited a man from mm. taking from yeah, taking a similar I don't know. approach. I think, I think um, it's much more about being in the margins, being marginal, mm-hmm. um, and I'd say probably the biggest kind of key and clue I got was from Camus mm-hmm. and. That um, you know, Camus' persona is is uh, you know the eye, the the the, the person watching mm-hmm. in in a lot of what he writes is is a, a marginal person, mm-hmm. and, and you know I think that 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 I don't think it's necess- I mean I agree that that in in f- this project the femininity of mm. the narrator is necessary because the thing that I the very first thing that had to be disposed of was in my mind the the thing that makes the novel this big rather than this big mm. which is the author trying to convince the reader that the author has not written the book mm-hmm. uh, and that you know the author makes their narrator a neuroscientist uh-huh. and it has to spend 500 pages showing how much <laughs> they know about neuroscience and creating you know convincing mm-hmm. this and convincing that and um, so I wanted there to be nothing that uh-huh. could happen looking at the book jacket, uh, you know, and thinking, mm-hmm. okay, they're the same person. And uh-huh. I, I didn't want to waste any of anybody's energy on, mm-hmm. on, on that game, I uh-huh. suppose. Um, and yeah, it's interesting. Like, I try not to, to, to read around the books I'm going to talk about because I think that can inform too much the, the the questions you're going to ask but i did see just a couple of places when i was looking at sort of press quotes of people referring to it as auto fiction mm. and I, I thought that was an interesting thing just because it's very she's very clearly named Faye, mm. and and so there's sort of there's um a sort of a signifier that that sort of you know, what, whether, whether there are elements of it that are similar to your life or not, there's this kind of a line being drawn. Yeah, in no, the it's sand. it's a much more. Um, it comes out of, you know, I am essentially, a, I suppose, a, I'm not a conser- I'm I'm a conservative, uh, in in the sense that I um, feel. I, I exist in reference to a classical tradition, mm-hmm. and I think that the auto fiction uh, world mm-hmm. genre writers. Um, it, I feel that we are all people who arrived at a roadblock, uh-huh. and I went this way, and they went that way. But essentially, it's a similar. We're just trying to get round the same thing, and uh-huh. to me, what a Sheila Hetty or a Nausgaard is doing is mm-hmm. utterly different from mm-hmm. from what I'm doing. But it's. A response to the same thing. It's just that my response is this, and mm-hmm. and um, so yeah, I, I don't. So just the label of autofiction that has been put on on it by people is that something that you would sort of 
You would sort um, of reject in a sense. So it sounds like yeah, you're coming from a similar... Yeah, I don't, recon- yeah. I, I don't recognise that in, in how I made these books. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might be how they look, yeah. <laughs> but it's not how I... How but that, I that's it. interesting. There seemed that this sort of, at least among some reviewers, to sort of determination to to decide that they are autofiction, to decide that um, the the fate that they meet or don't meet is can, can be mapped uh, onto yeah. you. Um, I mean, there's, you know, at the same time, a great desire for the for the autofiction mm. writer to call them to call their books novels, and sure. so so I, I suppose that's just the same thing the mm-hmm. other way around. Yeah, it's um, not wanting to be categorised, mm-hmm. I guess. Do you see the, um, the the way you spoke earlier about the um, you know not not wanting to not wanting to sort of expose yourself? Uh, in in the novels, or not wanting to sort of to 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 um, yeah to to leave yourself open to the you know to, to to people sort of pinning certain things on you, it's this sort of this withholding this this absence of Fay uh, from the novels. At first, it when I when I started reading Outline and Transit, I had the sense of sort of it could be seen as a sense of of retreat, and yet in Kudos, it suddenly dawned on me that that there's a strength to it as well that there's a kind of in this in this withholding of information in this sort of re- re- refusal to to divulge that it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, just just a retreat it can also be a, a sort of a sign of strength in the face of the the society in which the writer finds himself well i think it's also just uh it's it's how <laughs> Uh, existence is is mm-hmm. configured, um, and, and a novel. I think I think what I thought was that that you know I had entered such kind of dangerous waters. Mm-hmm. Um, so my various books that I'd written were were really um, memoirs that mm-hmm. I'd written were were. <coughs> I don't know how strong other writers are mm-hmm. <laughs> um, in terms of dealing with criticism, mm-hmm. but but it was an extraordinary attack that uh-huh. I was subjected to. Um, so I guess there was a reason to to um, think about this question of self, and and mm-hmm. um, and I'd always seen the truth teller person as. as a, a kind of Jesus person, mm-hmm. I guess, the person who comes out and says, "Okay, <laughs> you know, you can do what you want to me, but uh, I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to sacrifice myself, and but I'm putting myself mm-hmm. in in your in front of you for you to do your worst." And mm-hmm. and um, I, I guess that was what I I thought. Well, actually, that there's a a moral problem with the novel mm-hmm. uh, rather than <laughs> with readers or writers or there's a problem with this form mm-hmm. um, th- that it uh, it says that you can um, deeply inhabit another person mm-hmm. and okay so that's I suppose what what why I started reading books when I was whatever age I was um, the, the the feeling of inhabiting another consciousness mm-hmm. uh, was consoling uh, and um, I think and I mean that sh- sort of should still be okay mm-hmm. uh, I was talking to somebody yesterday about the, the Bronte sisters and, and going to the Bronte parsonage and the you know these three women who who really created, I suppose, for someone like me, mm. created the whole concept of uh-huh. <laughs> of of living in a book, mm. living in a book, reading it, living in it, and it it removing you from from your own existence, mm. from the experience of being yourself. Um, you go into the little museum by the parsonage, and it tells you that in the time that they lived there, um, in this village on top of this very sort of hill sort of shaped like this uh, there was a child mortality of 99% in mm. this village because the, they had an open sewer and they didn't hadn't worked it out that it was running into the water supply and, and so uh, is that ever mentioned in any of their books mm. no it isn't and um, so so those two you know that's mm. an, an example of, of how, you know what is the relationship mm. <laughs> between these two things between 
reality yeah. and and this thing and this this world that you can go and live in um and i guess i think the novel had had has become um so many so far removed even from that mm -hmm. in terms of point of view in terms of this idea that you can inhabit mm -hmm. another consciousness Th that if the writer is is inhabiting another consciousness and, and all you're then inhabiting their mm -hmm. habitation of um that seemed to me where the problem uh -huh. lay um, it se it seems also that um to kind of presuppose that there is a a consistent consciousness in which to inhabit as if there's sort of there's just one uh to, to each of us there's kind of a one sort of understandable comprehensible uh consciousness rather than something which is fluid and it's changing all the time and that can kind of well and that can choose not to remember anything um, right can, can choose not to be itself mm -hmm. you know tomorrow if it doesn't want to be and you know how how much of this <laughs> version of identity mm -hmm. that that we're given in in books um how much does it actually construct us mm -hmm. construct what we think our lives ought mm -hmm. to be um why do we choose to remember anything mm. or identify with anything um so so once you start to unpick that mm. really almost sort of cold-heartedly uh -huh. <laughs> and not as a human just as a technician which is what i was doing and see what it does to sentences mm. and see how this subjectivity mm. is created uh it almost is sickening you almost mm. can't um bear it anymore mm. um, and and that seems also to apply to the the subject of the the family as well so how does one talk in any sort of authentic way about what the what being in a, a family is being in a marriage having children the sort of the relationship between the husband and wife and and the relationship with the children and i think one of the um one one of one of the things that makes these books so strong on on the subject of the family is that we get this kind of multiplicity of voices this um multiplicity of points of view uh, and experience and family experiences so we're not giving we're not being given a sense of one family and one experience and in any way being told this is archetypal in any way we're being given lots of uh lots, lots of different understandings and approaches of the family and also a sense that none of the people who are talking really seem to be able to understand the dynamic of the family that they're coming from mm. too well it, it um i mean one of the things that that because of course you know any chink <laughs> that you leave open to judgment people will judge you sure. and and uh that particular chink in these books mm. is the fact that that all three of them occur in fairly short spaces of time mm -hmm. sort of four or five days when the narrator is not with her children uh -huh. and you know th th that 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 is the occasion mm -hmm. of the novels that's why she is writing this novel it's why mm -hmm. she's able to she's able to think in this way because she's not at home in the kitchen being mm -hmm. how she usually is and and um so so it i suppose that <laughs> that slightly creates a a, a premise of mm -hmm. of um a, a particular kind of of uh possibly a sort of abandoning or or uh. or um dysfunctional world of of family that mm -hmm. that um i've really hoped that people haven't taken it mm -hmm. as that um and i mean one of the i don't really read reviews very much uh. but but um you know i'm pretty sure that that one of the things that said is is that everybody sounds like the narrator or they all sound the same essentially uh, okay. and, and that this is really strange mm -hmm. they why do these people <laughs> all sound the same um and and i guess that attempt by me to 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 um i suppose break down the feeling of um reality or that seems mm -hmm. to me a sort of false feeling of reality that people have about their own sort of structured lives in which yeah you know there's a judgment about you know do you spend enough time with your children or do you, you know yeah. uh, and we're all sort of busy trying to, to work those things out mm -hmm. um 
that, that I wanted to achieve something much more oceanic in, mm. in terms of how these, how we're so so much the product of our moment in history, our, mm. the place where we live, the, the, you know, it's like you're drinking the water in a place and it's, it, it's part of you and, and, but you're also you. And, mm. and I think that's so true of these themes of family life and, and you know, we can seem so alien mm -hmm. to one another. Um, but actually, in, if you can, I suppose I've just tried to find a line which is talking <laughs> mm -hmm. where, where um, everyone brings themselves to, to a, a moral location, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, on, on that subject of talking, because um, when, when, when reading the books, you get a sense of the sort of the, as I said in the introduction, these uh, people seem sort of, disposed to, to hold forth uh, to Faye and to sort of to, to, to divulge um, things about their life. It's, it gives, it's reminiscent of maybe the confessional or a sort of a psychoanalytical um, session. Um, and I wonder if that just feeds into what you were just saying about that sort of, that sense of sort of, of bringing people together, almost like in the, in the sort of like, by representing this, this, these multiple conversations, it's almost... I don't want to say like a, a form of group therapy, but there's a sort of sense. Oh no, of, it's, it is. Oh, there is. Um, <laughs> completely based on on that, uh, or not completely, but mm -hmm. but the therapeutic model is definitely mm -hmm. um, part of it. And I mean, when you know, when you see, uh, and and indeed think about your own life in these terms, you know, moments in which you've lived in in a, a state of great belief <laughs> about your own life. And I mean, I see, I saw it on the train, you know, coming over here. They're, that there'll be the family on the train mm. and that they can barely notice what other people's realities oh. because for them you know the 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 drama of mm. <laughs> being them the th is completely compelling and that that that's what they're doing and and um i suppose i wanted to to get people in a state where they're out on the street, as it mm. were, where, where they're, they're naked, exposed. Mm. They don't have, they're not in this drama. Um, and, and they can see themselves and each other slightly more clearly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, part of what definitely sort of formed some, some of the, the uh, style of the book is, is my true belief that people have... A, a very native and natural grasp of form in mm -hmm. in recounting in talking in recounting stories um it's something that we you know learn to mm -hmm. do the second we can talk we, we learn to someone asks how was school today you know the kid tells the story of it and if people laugh at a particular mm -hmm. point the next day he'll like enlarge that bit a bit and uh -huh. you know every, everybody does it and and it's a that was and the idea that that actually is something that could almost mm -hmm. be called writing <laughs> yeah it is very different from writing but it could almost be called writing was um i suppose the, the kind of yeah foundation sort of structuring principle. um a sort of a understandable narrative for the the chaos of our own lives almost yeah and that is i mean i guess yeah the, the, the therapeutic model which mm -hmm. in itself is also a, a kind of writing um, mm. it's interesting to um to, to think of that because the um, I was I was trying to I was I was trying to <clears throat> un understand when I was going back and re reading the books if uh, if there was a sense immediately that they were destined to be a trilogy that there was going to be sort of um, you know that the, the, they were going to work in in the sort of in the, in the kind of a three act mm. structure like I, I wonder if you, if you knew from the beginning and I had a sense when reading outline that there's definitely a sense in that book that you're you're prepping the the reader a little bit for what's to come this sort of um in in very sort of subtle ways and i think only once you know what's coming mm -hmm. after you could uh, you have a sense of maybe the groundwork the ground rules being laid and sort of conversely in kudos uh at least i felt there was a sense of perhaps reflection on on the project uh, the reflection on yeah on what had come well, at before. that point i thought i'd been like doing this for <laughs> <laughs> six years or something and i could kind of make a few jokes mm -hmm. about it um which i sort of did but um, was the sort of the trilogy structure sort of locked in for you from the beginning no um only in as much as uh i i'm a, a short <coughs> I'm the person who's mm. clearing the plates away from the table before everyone's quite finished eating dinner. Uh -huh. You know, it, I'm, I end uh -huh. <laughs> things <laughs> as soon as I possibly can. And, and 
um, I've never written a really long book. Mm. Um, I don't think I have the confidence or the mm. feeling of entitlement or, or relaxation to do that. Mm. Um, for me, the the writing of a book is such a high wire. You know, I've, I, it's amazing to be on it and then I really uh. need to get off it or know when I'm going to get off it. And so I think the three was the only way I could write uh-huh. a, at a much bigger scale and mm. essentially they are what you know it is a long book uh-huh. um but but I had to do it in these parts mm. and you know I understood at the end of outline that I had uh, asked more questions mm. possibly than I'd answered um and that actually it was all very well to say uh to to have this not nihilistic exactly, mm. but 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 <coughs> <coughs> unbodied uh, mm. narrator. But at a certain point, she has to go back to her life and, uh-huh. and live in a house and live in a body and relate to people. And mm. I mean, she could just swim off and into the sea and uh-huh. sing because she considers doing it at a certain point. Mm. But um, so it was really knowing that actually those some of this had to be. Uh, the causes uh-huh. uh, of, of of it, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, which were also the causes of my anger, I suppose, uh-huh. um, had to be addressed, and that took it, it mm-hmm. has taken fully three books to and sort of get there. And one thing that I guess writing and publishing them sort of two years apart as well allowed sort of particularly with kudos the um, events to intervene um, because uh, kudos obviously published this year. Transit 2016, Outline 2014. And we get, um, perhaps inevitably in a British novel uh, that's been written between, you know, 2015, 2016, sort of Brexit makes um, makes a sort of... It makes a few appearances and it also sort of allows um, a sort of reflection on, I think, returning to this idea of sort of withholding uh, opinions and feelings. And there's a moment, I, th- I noted it down where, um, if I can just find it um yeah you you said uh, i said it was true that the question of whether to leave or remain was one we usually ask ourselves in private uh the final surrender of personal consciousness into the public domain um and it suddenly made me think yeah this kind of we do perhaps live in an age in which the 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 pressure even is to sort of is to get everything out there to, to you know everything one's feeling to sort of to, to define oneself and that in in the the fact that Faye doesn't do that in these mm. books is in fact some sort of almost a political act in itself. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's sort of two questions there. And one is, mm. I mean, Brexit in a lot of ways is sort of tailor made for me. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think any political issue could have because it is divorce. It's, it's so the themes that. Um, that you know I've mm. been interested in the last few years um, so so I, I'm very wary of, of allowing um, sort of current events mm. or politics or uh, to, to, to make their mark in in a piece of work because it uh, it seems ridiculous to quote Hemingway in this bookshop, but I'm going to do it. Um, <laughs> I think he said it's the bit you put in the you can put in the politics if you like, but in ten years' time, that's the, those are the pages that everyone's just going to be like, you know, turning them over and not reading them because sure. they're not, you know. Um, and I kind of agree with that. I mm-hmm. guess uh, you, you you have to find some. Um, you have to put those politics into a structure and for mm. me I, that was what I was trying to do was put them into this I just sort of took a gamble and thought mm. well in fact it, it kind of is these are the same themes and, mm. and they're just it's, it's the illness is cropping up you know <laughs> in our in the, at the very surface mm. of, of our society um, rather than in you know specific stories about people's lives yeah um, I can't remember what the second bit of your question. Um, it was more just the, the, the withholding being a kind of a political act in, a, in an age where people are sort of encouraged yeah. to express. I think that um, that's something that I didn't uh, think of as anything meaning anything beyond my own mm-hmm. self uh, when I began outline, and now I think um, actually the value of silence mm-hmm. <laughs> is um, becoming clearer and clearer, and, and it's. Um, 
you know, it's so interesting. I mean, to any writer, it's mm. it's interesting and frightening. Um, the the sort of culpability of language, uh, you know, or the the possibility of language, you know, being or, or have at least a new consciousness that we might have to mm -hmm. use language more morally um, yeah. and and be more careful <coughs> in what we say and. Um, and then who gets to say anything mm -hmm. uh, is is the other thing. Mm -hmm. So I sort of felt, I mean, despite the fact that, that I did kind of, I suppose, arrive at these realisations to the extent that, that, it, that it seemed a morally unobjectionable place to simply sort of read the surface mm -hmm. and... Um, you know, I I also feel unsure of mm -hmm. uh, what I'm allowed to say, uh -huh. uh, what I w whether I will continue to be allowed to say anything, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of strange. Yeah, um, place to be. I'm very conscious there will be questions from the audience, but I do just want to finish um, because it, it, it I guess it's almost impossible not to when a book, uh, or particularly outline and kudos. Uh, involves so many literary events, um, and uh, <laughs> I kind it's of a funny one, isn't it? Reporting on them at festivals. <laughs> I, I'm in dangerous waters in, uh, in this one, yeah. <laughs> and and sort of and uh, just talk, talking about the kind of the world of books uh, generally, um, there were a couple of very striking pages in um, in Kudos talking about the the so I guess the sort of the state of literature now and the sort of the state of um, of publishing. Um, and this sense, um, I think where there's, there's, there's a moment where you write, uh, we publishers proceed on, or a publisher is speaking, they say, we, we publishers proceed on the assumption that no one cares about books. Um, or, again, that um, we're always being threatened with extinction as though novels likewise had once been fierce and were now fragile and defenceless. Um, and so I just, I guess my final question tonight is about the, the potential role of the novel and your your, your novel specifically that like do you do you see the world as one in which novels can can still make an impact in the way perhaps they did in previous generations I mean, it depends who's writing them uh -huh. obviously and how they <laughs> how they're being written i i think that the whole idea of um <coughs> literature or any art as being s sacred mm -hmm. um is very much to blame for for uh, you know if there if there has been a, a, a sort of outliving of the novel's usefulness mm -hmm. or or um, it's this idea that you know reading is really good for children for uh -huh. instance or or that reading is good that mm -hmm. reading is morally beneficial um, rather than just being uh, a form of escapism. Mm -hmm. um, people can do what they want if this bookshop chooses to start selling hamburgers that is not a moral crime mm -hmm. um instead of books you know it, it what i see is is um maybe a certain kind of literature becoming if it, if it is literature mm -hmm. a certain kind of writing possibly becoming extinct out of surfeit you mm -hmm. know as maybe we're all going to become extinct um just by there being too much of it uh -huh. and <laughs> an over supply mm -hmm. um and then other kinds of literature i think are um in that d sort of delightful if it, if it didn't mean that the rest of the world is in complete crisis but mm -hmm. <laughs> which it always does you know when literature has this wonderful role to play mm -hmm. in fortifying people and mm -hmm. fortifying individuals which is what it's about mm -hmm. it's saying the group you know can <laughs> go over there and the individual is what matters mm -hmm. and that is what a book does it is one individual talking to another individual and that is its strength and um i still see it i see mm -hmm. it as alive as ever just not where necessarily where anybody thinks it is uh -huh. but uh, but i see it as alive as ever um mm -hmm. not winning prizes not you know uh, <laughs> uh any of that but yeah. but um yeah which i think is a great note to hand over to you if you have a question for rachel Cusk, raise your hand we'll get a microphone to you so everyone can hear who would like to to kick us off yeah okay <laughs> well tell you what you can have my microphone uh, 
sometimes one has a feeling that that one of the cousins of literary festivals are creative writing courses. Uh, have you done one? Have you taught one? Do you think they are actually distorting the world of fiction by producing lots of um, sausage-like books? Um, <laughs> I, I didn't... I've never done a creative writing course. Um, I have taught. I was a professor at uh, a university... Uh, in the south of London for some years. Um, I And my feeling, it was a very unprestigious place where I taught and that was good because people, uh, people, I suppose this the whole idea of, of, you know, the terrible idea that we all have in our heads of the American MFA course that, that where the students want their money back if their book isn't on the New York Times bestseller list, you know, a year later. Um, that, that was not my experience. Uh, my experience was of people wanting uh, an answer to the question of why there was a difference between what they felt to be true and what uh, seemed or what other people said was true and that's exactly the same difference that I observed when I was four and I went to the supermarket with my mother and we came back and she told a story of what happened there and I thought no that's not what happened you know that isn't what happened and uh, that that has has I suppose been my calling um, but I've <coughs> always felt that someone coming to learn an art um, is really asking a question about themselves is, is can I is my supposition is my idea of what what is real and true uh, can I pit that against the world um, I think that's a pretty um, hopeful uh, thing um, and at the very least a creative writing course is not war it, and <laughs> it isn't violent and it isn't it doesn't waste very much especially now it doesn't even waste paper so um, <laughs> uh, I think it does no harm and uh, if people are sitting in a room talking about um, writing, that's better than a lot of other things. Um. We have a question, a young lady just over the hand up, just on the other side of the oh. <laughs> Um, well, in fact, they're not very long. They're really big type, and <laughs> <laughs> they have really big spaces in, in the lines. Um, so they're all quite short. Uh, no, literally, I count the words, and I think, okay, I'm done. As soon as I <laughs> reach, I can go now. Um, it, yeah, because for me, there's a p writing is a performance. Um, it, it's I don't uh, rewrite particularly I think a lot before I write I know everything about what I'm going to write and then I do it and when I've done it I've done it and I'm desperate to stop um, so I don't really I've always envied the the person who for whom writing is a, is a habit of being um, which it isn't for me um, and yet I'm I suppose in a way I'm slightly suspicious of that too. Um, I, I take it seriously as a thing that I find extremely difficult to do rather than as some, some natural thing that, that I'm entitled to do. That's a lady just there. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, hello. Um, you just said, uh, I, I thought you were going to answer the question that I was going to ask because you said you think a lot about what you're going to write. Um, before you write it and then you get on with it or get to it. 
I was wondering whether at any point you find what you want to say by writing it, that the writing tells you what you want to say. You know, a bit like the nouveau roman writers. Yeah, yeah, no, and that, that's... A, you know what I mean? Um, it, it's, it's a rampant sort of theory <laughs> of 20th century um, fiction writing that... that your characters it, it's the E.M. Forster school <laughs> rather than the Nabokov school um, the E.M. Forster school is my characters live they have a life separately from me and they tell me what to do and they tell me what they're going to do and they you know and, and I'd say I, I very very rarely meet a writer who who um, works as I do most people do find that and the advice that you're given at the creative writing course and I always disagree with this advice is you know just the most important thing is the act of writing that you just have to you know you sit at your desk at nine o'clock in the morning and you write whatever is in your head and if what is in your head is not particularly interesting well there we go but it's better to write it down than not I, I don't agree with that um <laughs> <laughs> I don't agree. I wouldn't give it as advice. Um, I suppose uh, it's not your practice. It's not my practice, uh, and I'm not entirely sure sort of where it leads to, um, what the value of it is uh, of just writing anything that comes into your head. Um, I'm, I'm, I suppose, more interested maybe than than some writers in technique and writing as a you know I wouldn't sit down and say that I could play Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto you know without knowing an awful lot about how to actually do that um yeah it's really not that um god what a responsibility yeah, I know it's for the group <laughs> <laughs> well, it's okay for you, you're published. This. I'm only a publisher, it's my different. Um, yeah, no, I didn't mean in terms of, you know, the realistic novel, etc. but because also you were talking earlier about um, how not that therapeutic your writing is, but that it's inspired perhaps or uh, mimetic of the th therapeutic process. Well, so this, this, the therapeutic situation, yeah. Situation. So I was wondering whether in your writing sometimes of what people say, not characterization and, you know, plot or whatever, this 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 was your practice or if you calculate in advance, but that's that, that was the essence of my question. Because the, the, the therapeutic uh, situation implies that uh, you, you know, you come out with stuff that you haven't thought of before. Yeah, so it just seems to me that that was a form that would be quite familiar to people and that if you needed to think, what is this that I'm reading, which, you know, it, when I finished Outline, I thought no one, it really was the first thing I thought on finishing was nobody will be able to read this because the form is, it's too... Um, it asks you to do things and people don't want to do things when they're reading they want to so you know they don't want to read thomas mm. bernhardt they want to <laughs> they want to read jane eyre or you know the so you're very very self-conscious of the effect that you're writing is yeah and how it's going to be perceived and it's commercial no no not commercially but one does not want to write a book that people actually can't read that that would be a shame and um i had banked on the therapeutic situation the therapeutic form as being familiar enough to people that that, that would provide some navigation you know that you're in this pages and pages of people <coughs> going on and, and sometimes these stories becoming you know someone telling a story about someone saying something to them about someone else saying that you know so so that that's very far from the 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 lived moment um <coughs> And I thought, well, actually, you know, that is kind of what the therapist person does, is hold this amazing <laughs> invisible planet in their head of, uh, you know, of space and time, and, and that that might be something the reader could also use as a touchstone. And then uh, when I finished it, I thought, well, I'm not sure that will work. So, so um, I, yeah, I was pleased that it did work, and I don't know whether that's why it did. Um, 
I think we've got time for one more question before we knock it at the gentleman. Just there. It's coming to you there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, John Kutsia, uh, a, a book, uh, he's also used a, a woman writer as a way of questioning the novel and asking questions about the novel, the Elizabeth novels. And I wonder whether you had read that, whether, whether what your approach, because cause something of, of your endeavor and the way that you write, uh, I'm a South African, but it has a ring of, of, of it's the wrong way of saying it, but it has a ring of, 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 the, of the John Kutzier approach to a different language, a different exploration mm -hmm. of what the novel could be, mm -hmm. and the perceptions from which the, one writes and records memory. And I wonder whether that's, whether there's yeah, a have, connection there. I have read some of that writing. Um, I don't know why I haven't read more of it. Um, so this is probably a long answer to that question, but um, I guess I identify him as somebody who has understood that uh, he's doing something dangerous and that he has to, you, you have to take great care and that these ways of... Um, these frames and, and uh, w ways of creating distance uh, or objectivity, really, which is what it is, um, are, I suppose, the, the, ex the ways in which you become expert <laughs> if you're living in a, 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 an explosive um, world or set of themes, you, you get good at, at uh, minimising the danger of being misunderstood. Um, the more you disrupt um, the, the and actually this is sort of a, a answer to your question as well the, the, the subjective narrative flow where you're being born down river and carried away and, and it's speaking and out it's coming um, is, a, is a dangerous position to put yourself in um, it's an out of control position and uh, Kutsia as I say, you know, I recognise him, and I, I like a lot of his other work, but I recognise him as a very careful technical person <laughs> who who understands how dangerous it is to to um, make yeah make mistakes in this area. His, his Elizabeth Costello novels really, it's interesting that he chooses a woman writer. Yeah. As a, and, as, and I you mean, know. I read some of that writing and and sort of thought. Uh, felt um very admiring of it and 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 then i wasn't sure that that his uh use of i don't mean that in a derogatory way but but of a, of a female narrator i i i just wasn't sure about that and even though she's not not a very female female <laughs> she's a very dry you know very un you know he he but i didn't understand why she was female but i suppose it's precisely what i'm saying which was that need to put up some fences um around things and anyway for whatever reason but i will now go and read it um. <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure we have it in stock will we? <laughs> by tomorrow um, <laughs> that is unfortunately all we've got time for um at least for as I say, the formal part of the evening, but do stick around, have a glass of wine with us. Um, we have plenty of uh, Rachel Cusk's book available at the front, of course, uh, Kudos, uh, Outline and Transit as well, and um, I, I think all of uh, Rachel Cusk's back catalogue as well available there, so do pick up a copy at the front. Rachel will be here signing uh, those for you, uh, but all that remains for me to say is please join me in thanking Rachel Cusk. Thank you.